Good morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. We are studying the subject of healing and the case for healing, giving you proofs and evidences that healing is absolutely, positively, unquestionably, undeniably God's will for you. And yesterday I finished the program. We are now talking about this evidence, this proof that God wants you healed. And that is God has promised you, that is, if you're born again, long life. God has promised you long life. And then I shared with you Genesis 6, 3. This is where God established the length of days for man's life. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. So we see here, God established the length of days for man's life to be a hundred and twenty years. This was in Genesis chapter six, verse three. God never changed that. Never is it recorded in scripture after this, that God made a new decree replacing this one where he changed the days, the length of days for man. He never changed it. And he said, as it says in James 117, he does not change like shifting shadows. Another place he said, I, the Lord do not change. God set forth this command in Genesis six, three. It has never changed. It has never been overturned. It has never been replaced by a new command. Genesis 6, 3 still stands today that God has ordained and decreed for man. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. You need to expect to live and believe to live one hundred and twenty years. And then you might say, but I always thought it was 70 or 80 years. Well, you have misunderstood as well as your teachers have misunderstood scripture. The Bible does not set 70 or 80 years as the length of our days for all people, for all generations. That 70 or 80 years is found in Psalm 90, Psalm 90. And you first have to understand who wrote it and what was the context What was the condition or situation? Psalm 90 was not written by David. It was written by Moses. It's a actually a prayer, a prayer of Moses. And I might call it even a cry of Moses, even somewhat of a complaint of Moses. But it's called a prayer. And in verse seven, it says, we are consumed by your anger. Verse nine says, all our days pass away under your wrath. Why under wrath? Wrath has to do with judgment. Wrath is not the same thing as anger because it is anger that actually brings a judgment. Wrath is judgment. Wrath is judgment, not just anger, but judgment. And so In verse nine, all our days pass away under your wrath, or you could say under your judgment. And then in verse 10, Moses said, the length of our days is 70 years or 80. If we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow. Now, does that sound like the life of a born again, Christian new creation in Christ? Well, Probably, yes, there are a lot of people living that way, but that's not the way you should live. That's not the the life God has provided in Christ. That is not the life God provided in Christ. Why were they spending their days under his wrath? Well, we read in Hebrews chapter four, and then, of course, you go back to Exodus and Numbers, particularly, where you see what they did. You read what they did. But in Hebrews chapter three, it it talks about God said, I was angry with that generation in verse 10. 
and verse 11. So I declared on oath in my anger, they will never enter my rest. Why was God angry with them? Because of their unbelief, disobedience and rebellion. This generation that came out of Egypt, they came out of Egypt and they continually tested God. They continually tempted God. They continually complained and over and over and over again, they would say, why did you bring us out here into the wilderness to die? We're just going to die here. It would have been better that we had stayed in Egypt. And so they said those things saying they were going to die in the wilderness. And then when they reached the promised land, they would not go in. They would not go in because of their unbelief. That, you could say it in modern vernacular, that ticked God off. That made God mad. That angered him. And he said, so I was angry with that generation. I declared in my oath, on my oath, I declared on oath in my anger, excuse me, on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And then he said, you will get exactly what you've said. You're going to go back in the wilderness and there you will die. You will get what you said. Now, I want you to catch that. Do you realize they said again and again, again, we're going to die in the wilderness. We'll just die out here in the wilderness. Why did he bring us here in the wilderness to die? And God said, okay, you will get what you said. That's the power of words. The power of confession. They confessed they would die in the wilderness because of that. That was also related to their unbelief. They did not. They refused to enter into the promised land and receive the life God had for them. So God said, yes, you're going to go ahead and die in the wilderness. And so he sent them back out into the wilderness where they wandered for 40 years. Well, God did not hold the children accountable. It was the adults. It was the parents who were accountable for that decision to not enter the promised land. So the parents were responsible. The parents were responsible. So anybody, for example, if you say approximately 30 years old and older, they were accountable. And in the next 40 years, they all died. And if they had been 40 years old when they refused to go into the promised land, then they could maybe live maybe up to the age of 80. Or if they were only 30 and and wandered for 40 years, they maybe could live up to 70. And so that's where the 70 or 80 years comes from. It is the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness where every single Israelite died after refusing to go into the promised land. So 70 or 80 years was judgment on disobedience. 70 or 80 years was judgment on disobedience, a disobedient, rebellious generation And that's why Psalm 90 verse nine, all our days pass away under your wrath, wrath being his judgment on them. So 70 or 80 years is not for everybody. You see, 70 or 80 years is not for everybody. That was judgment on disobedience and rebellion. God never changed his decree for, for mankind in Genesis six, three. The statute he gave man's days shall be a hundred and twenty. You see, God did not even say this in Psalm 90. Psalm 90 verse 10. The length of our days is 70 years or 80. That was not the words of God. That was the words of Moses. Those were the words of Moses. They were not the words of God. They were not God's decree. They were not God's um, new law that would replace Genesis 6, 3. That these were the words of Moses. So Genesis 6, 3 still stands. Now, 
in the, of course, in the New Testament, we have, we are born again, new creation in Christ Jesus. And in the last few days, also, I gave you the definition of Zoe, Zoe life. That is life that is abundant and life that is vigorous. Hallelujah. Vigorous, energetic life. It is life, absolute fullness of life, a life active and vigorous. That is Zoe life that you receive when you're born again. That is obviously a picture of excellent health to have fullness of life, a life active and vigorous. That is Zoe life, the Greek word for life that is most commonly used in the New Testament. That's the life we should have. And it is obviously a picture of excellent health. Now, I want to show you where 70 or 80 years had been because of judgment, 40 years judgment, cutting off everybody who was accountable in uh, among the Israelites in the wilderness. I want to show you other examples in the Bible where men lived more than 120 years, even after Genesis six. Okay. Genesis six, three is before the flood of Noah. When God sees the increase of wickedness, he declared that man's days will be 120 years. Why? Well, before that, they were living 800, 900, more than 900 years. And that allowed sin to multiply exponentially when men lived so long. So he cut their years to 120 as a curb, a curb for sin so that sin could not overflow. You know, some people think that we live in a very wicked generation and we do, but some people think that this might be the most wicked of any time on earth. I don't believe so. I believe that Genesis chapter six before the flood was the most wicked men had ever been on the earth. God limited man's years to 120 to curb sin. So it couldn't keep overflowing and and exponentially growing. Sin was curbed. We are not, I don't believe, at the wickedness level that they were at before the flood that caused God to release the flood on the earth. And that was judgment on sin. I don't believe our generation is that wicked yet. But anyway, I want you to see that after Genesis chapter six, after the flood of Noah, there were still righteous men who lived more than 120 years. More than 120 years. Let me show you. Abraham. In Genesis 25. Verses 7 and 8. Genesis 25. Verses 7 and 8. Altogether. Abraham lived. A hundred and seventy five years. A hundred and seventy five. A hundred and seventy five years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age. Now that's what the Bible calls old age. We have a description in the Bible for old age. What is old age? Well, here, 175 years. That is old age. Abraham died at a good old age. That's a good old age, an old man and full of years. Hallelujah. So we see in Genesis 25, a righteous man, even after God decreed man's days shall be 120, a righteous man surpassed that. 
a righteous man went beyond that. A righteous man lived a hundred and seventy five. And then look at Isaac. Isaac in Genesis thirty five, Genesis thirty five, twenty eight and twenty nine. Twenty eight and twenty nine. Isaac lived a hundred and eighty years. Uh, he lived a hundred years longer than most people today even dream of living. If people dream of living to eighty, he lived a hundred years more to a hundred and eighty. So I encourage you, don't think about eighty, think about a hundred and eighty. Isaac lived a hundred and eighty years. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people old, old and full of years. Again, we have a description of what the Bible calls old, old in the Bible here in this verse is a hundred and eighty years. Can you see that 70 or 80 is like a baby or a youth? 70 or 80 years is but a youth. 180 is old, according to scriptures. Then look at Jacob. Genesis 47, 28. Genesis 47, 28. Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years. And the years of his life were a hundred and forty seven, a hundred and forty seven, a hundred and forty seven. Notice that each one, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, went far beyond a hundred and twenty, way beyond, not just one or two years. They blew by a hundred and twenty, they blew past a hundred and twenty. Abraham lived 175, Isaac lived 180, and Jacob lived 147. They all blew past 120. They were righteous men of God, and they had faith. Now look at what Jacob said to Pharaoh. When Joseph brought his father to Egypt, he introduced his father to Pharaoh. And in Genesis 47... Where he introduced Joseph introduced Jacob to Pharaoh. Genesis forty seven, seven through nine. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Verse eight. Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? Now isn't that an interesting question? You don't normally just ask anybody, how old are you? Except probably Jacob looked old. And so here is Pharaoh, probably around Joseph's age. And Joseph was the youngest of 12 sons. And so Pharaoh looks at Jacob and asks him bluntly, how old are you? How old are you? Verse nine. And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty. So at that point, he was already a hundred and thirty. Well, he probably did look kind of old. A hundred and thirty. But notice his next words. My years have been few. My years have been few. Jacob called 130 few. The years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult. Well, he doesn't go into the story how he also had lived a rather bad life for a little while until he also got turned around. 
and he says, my years have been few and difficult and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. My years have been few and difficult and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. So notice Jacob said at 130 years old, my years have been few. We need to look at life like that. 130 years to the patriarchs were few. To Jacob, it was few. Why? Because his father lived to 170. No, his father lived to 180. His grandfather lived to 175. So we see our patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, each one of them blew past 120 years. Then let's look at Moses. Moses in Deuteronomy 34, 7. Deuteronomy 34, 7. Moses was 120 years old when he died. Now, isn't that interesting? The man who saw God face to face, he fulfilled the number of days that God commanded in Genesis 6, 3. 120 years. Moses was 120 years old when he died. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. So that's a picture of vigorous life to 120. Vigorous life to 120. His eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. And then... Let's look at Moses' father. Moses' father was Amram. And in Exodus 6, 20, it says Amram lived 137 years. 137 years. That was Moses' father. Lived 137 years. So we see again another example of someone living more than 120. And now look at Aaron, Aaron, the brother of Moses, who became high priest of Israel. Numbers 33, 39, Numbers 33, 39, Aaron was a hundred and twenty three, a hundred and twenty three years old when he died on Mount Hor. So Aaron lived longer than Moses. Moses lived to 120. Aaron lived 123 years. And so I want you to see that even after Genesis 6, 3, the righteous people who lived by faith in God went past 120. Moses lived exactly to 120 The other examples went past. The patriarchs blew by 120 years. So you see, 70 or 80 is not the rule. It is not the rule. 120 years was God's rule. And now let's look at Caleb. I want to give you his example. Caleb. Caleb was the other person with Joshua who was one of the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who entered the promised land and came back with a good report. They believed God's word. They said, yes, we can take it. Let's go in. Caleb was one of the believing spies. And so that when all the other Israelites died in the wilderness, Caleb and Joshua were the only two of that generation who lived. They were the only two in that generation who lived. Joshua 14, verses 10 through 12. Caleb said, Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said to to Moses and Israel moved about in the desert. So he was 40 When he went in as a spy, he was 40 when he was a spy going into 
the promised land. And then he survived the 40 years in the wilderness. And this is now five years past that where they are now beginning to conquer the promised land. And he said, he has kept me alive for 45 years. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous. That's like the word Zoe vigorous. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then notice here is a man who says he is 85 years old and he is just as vigorous to go to battle at 85 years old as he was when he was 40 years old. He's at 85 just as vigorous as he was when he was 40. Now, this does not say how long he lived, but at 85, he was just as vigorous as he was when he was 40. And at this point, he goes in to take the promised land. And he also says to Joshua, give me that mountain. That's the mountain where the giants were. He wanted the giants. He wanted the giants. He said, give them to me. Hallelujah. Well, join me again tomorrow. And remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.